Best Book Bits podcast brings you Christy Olferman, author of The Peer Revolution, Group Coaching That Ignites the Power of People. She's also the founder and CEO of Edge Leadership, an organization that creates belonging through group coaching. Christy, thanks for being on the show. Thank you, sir. Very glad to be here. And hello, everyone. No worries. Now, for my audience out there, this is your first podcast. So talk to me about uh, a little bit about yourself. Where did you grow up? Where did you go to school? What did you do after you left school? How did it all unfold for you in the early days? Ah, I love it. In the early days. So yes, I am leaning into vulnerability. It is my very first podcast. And um, let me think, what is important for you to know about me? I would say I challenge the status quo. Everything I do, I believe in thinking differently. Um, and I grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. My, I went through Catholic schools for 16 years, actually. And uh, my very first job outside of the university was with Johnson & Johnson. So I was a surgical sales rep and I found myself in the operating rooms across Western Pennsylvania, um, showing doctors new technologies on patients. And while I was a pretty good sales rep, um, my favorite part of my job was mentoring new hires. So Johnson & Johnson, huge global company, had a um, very robust mentoring program where good sales reps mentored new hires, good division managers mentored good sales reps, all the way up so that our leaders in the C-suite were actively involved in mentoring. And I say I didn't know it at the time, but I fell in love with adult development because what was way more fulfilling for me, Michael, was to sit down with a new hire and help that person chart out their success, how they were gonna improve credibility with their clients, how they were gonna build rapport with their teams. And so after a couple of years, I assumed that this is what management is all about, right? It's about mentoring people and growing people. And so I should obviously be a sales manager now. Um, Johnson & Johnson had the philosophy that if you wanna move up, you have to move out, meaning you have to move to a different territory. And I was a single mom at the time and had no interest in leaving my support system and structure in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So I went through a recruiting firm, landed at Bayer. So still big global healthcare, still sales, but this time as a sales manager. And it only took me a year, about, to go down in flames. <laughs> so the very qualities that make someone a good salesperson um, actually make them a C minus sales manager, right? The, you know, I couldn't hold anybody accountable for results. Um, I wanted everybody to like me. I started doing my team's jobs and, um, and I almost got fired. Now, luckily for me, um, instead of firing me, Bear moved me into training and development. And I learned that there was a job, there was a role purely focused on motivating, inspiring, um, and developing people. And it was a coach. And I became a coach at that point in my mid-20s, started my first coaching company at the ripe old age of 27, went in-house in the construction industry, spent seven years in corporate, moving my way up to the head of HR, and then in 2013, left and went out to do it again a little differently. Yeah, awesome. You're yeah, awesome. One of the stories you tell in your book, and thank you for sharing, running in uh, the rain from your car, getting soaking wet, um, having a meeting with uh, your, yeah, and how it, you came to that point of uh, a bit of a breakdown. Can you explain about that moment and what happened after that? Yeah, absolutely. Where I started the book, um, quite frankly, was when you say, when you say, Michael, um, a breakdown, I often say as a coach, we have to break down to break through. And that was absolutely that space for me. You know, it was a rainy Tuesday morning and I had my very first presentation with my new peer group. So I was the first female manager in my company. And after two years with the organization was promoted to vice presidents, which made me the first female vice president in the company's history. And I was giving a presentation to my peers who were all men, 
all men who had stay-at-home wives, uh, and I was a single mom, and there were a lot of, how do I want to say it, I guess rumors, really, I would say, rumors going around about me at the time. Um, you know, I was a single mom. I was a coach, which was very, in 2006, was very new to the, co to the construction industry, and I had a lot of one-on-one -on -one meetings with male leaders behind closed doors. So you can imagine what was being said about me. And I was aware of it all and super anxious about this very first presentation with my new peer group and proving my credibility. Sounds like, have you seen the TV show Billions where you've got the, the, the lady, what's her name, where she's basically the, the head coach for um, the, the characters in there. Yeah, that's when you said that, that's exactly what it reminds me of. But yeah, but in, I will tell you, my friend, in 2006, before Billions was there, um, the um, the guys used to call me Dr. Malfi. So do you remember the Sopranos were out in like the early 2000s? And, and I would keep saying, I'm not a therapist. Like I'm a coach, I'm not a therapist. There's a distinction. Um, but yes, I really love that character in Billions. Actually. So your book is amazing. I've read the book recently. Uh, fantastic. And we'll jump into what it is. But what made you decide to, to write the book? Um, you know, I would say, honestly, I feel like I've been writing the book for 10 years, um, but the impetus for actually putting pen to paper and making it all come about, um, probably like a lot of authors, I found myself in this space of transition during the pandemic and then the lockdown. And I um, was really privileged to be a part of a global cohort of 50 leaders that was selected by Dr. Brene Brown in her research in 2018 to, um, to become the first group of corporate coaches, leadership coaches, executive coaches to be trained in her work to bring it to organizations. And this little cohort of 50 of us, um, after we went through our development experience with Brene back in 2019, stayed together on a Facebook group. And in October of 2020, someone, and so these are all coaches who have their own thriving practices, someone had made a post about group coaching. And they said, you know what, I really, I wanna get trained in this. Does anybody know of any schools that are teaching group coaching? And um, the whole thread is no, no one's teaching it. Every, all the coaching schools are still teaching coaching one-on-one. -on -one. You can learn how to become a group facilitator, but that's not the same thing as group coaching. Anyway, I missed this entire thread but one of the coaches who has who had at the time been shadowing me tagged me in the post and said, I've spent the last 18 months learning from Christy Effelman. She's built an entire company doing this. Um, hey, Christy, heads up. And so I jumped in on the thread and said, if you guys want to do a hour long Zoom, throw me your questions. I'll answer them. I'll do anything I can to support you. And no, there isn't any schools that I know of anyway that are teaching group coaching. So that was October, and like everyone's schedules being what it is, it's early December by the time we can get everybody together for this one-hour Zoom on a Monday afternoon. And so the day before, on Sunday morning, I'm having my morning coffee, and I get out my clipboard, which is pretty much how I wrote the book. <laughs> I get out my clipboard and my cup of coffee, and I sit down, and I think to myself, all right, I have a group of coaches. What is important for them to know? And the very first thing I wrote down was the container. Can't have group coaching without the container. And then I wrote about outcomes and relevant content. And then I thought, well, you can't really do that well unless you have a grounding of self-awareness. And then I wrote down self-awareness. And before I knew it, I had six titles with a little paragraph under each of them. And I thought, all right, this is what I'll go into the Zoom call with. Six elements that ended up being the framework for the book. We had the one hour Zoom call. The feedback was overwhelmingly positive. They're saying to me, you need to write a white paper on this, put something out there. I've never heard of anything like this. It's, you know, it's really powerful. And um, I had dinner with my husband, his name was Kevin that night. And I said, I think I have the outline for my book. That was December. Um, January of 2021, I found an amazing book shepherd who, um, you know, introduced me from a publisher and graphic artists and editors and all the beautiful things that book shepherds bring to us and um, started the book in January and finished it in August.
Awesome. Congratulations. Yeah, I was going to ask you how did the how did the book come about? Now, what is the book about? What's your summary of the book? So for people listening, we'll jump into deep dive into the, the chapters and what a container is and that. But what what's the book overall about? Uh, so the book is how to curate connection and belonging period, full stop. Um, we, When I originally wrote it, I wrote it from the lens of coaches, whether external coaches who have their own practice and they've learned how to be a one-on-one coach, but they want to integrate group coaching into their practice to increase their impact and their revenue, or internal coaches, which I spent seven years as one in the construction industry, who are you know leadership, learning and development professionals who don't want to train people the way we trained people. Uh, you know, in the 1990s, we want to elevate our experience and integrate group coaching. Um, so that's how the book started off. What's interesting, Michael Knight, is when we went through the peer review process in the fall, we also included internal, external coaches, we included executives. Because it was really important for me that whenever the book was published, that it would land with corporate folks because that's my clientele, it's Fortune 500 companies. And the feedback that came back from the peer review is that we were thinking too narrowly in terms of the audience for the book, um, that anyone who is a people leader would get value from the book because truly at its heart, it's about how do we curate connection and belonging and how do we do so in a 100% virtual world? Yeah, and the thing with COVID is everyone's gone to a virtual world, but it's also made us vulnerable enough to talk about certain things as well, where before that was sort of off the table, where now that's on the table and it's not going off the table anymore. No, let's hope it doesn't, Michael, right? Like, I don't want to go back. I don't, and I don't, quite frankly, I don't think we're going to. Um, and as difficult as this space is that we are all in right now, um, the fact that we are all getting more comfortable with being uncomfortable around vulnerability, I think is a really big, big shift. Yeah, definitely, especially human to human as well. Jumping into the book, you talk about a couple of things. So you start off with S equals GB plus GP plus F, which means success equals growing the business plus growing the people plus having fun along the way. I really love that, uh, how you start off with that, which, yeah, a lot of people forget that, you know, success is about business, it's about people, and it's about having fun as well. Section one, you talk about the revolution, the power of peer relationships. You talk about sort of what peer technology means, which you basically found in 2013. So peer stands for partnership, experience, exposure, and reflection. Do you want to expand a little bit about the power of peer relationships? Oh, absolutely. Um, You know, I say that I quite by accident fell into um, peer mentoring. You know, when I found myself that rainy Tuesday morning um, and I had my breakdown to breakthrough, I came out of that meeting and said, I don't want to do this alone again. And so I started joining all of these. So at the time, I figured that what I was going through had to do with the fact that I was a woman in a male-dominated industry. It pretty seemed, you, you could see how that would be the case. So I thought, well, I just need to find female mentors. And if I can find been there, done that women, that's what I used to call them, then they can tell me how to navigate, you know, going from, um, you know, mid-level leader to an officer in the company and what's involved in that. And when there's no one that looks like you around that boardroom table, how do you find your voice and how do you use it? Um, And so I started asking people to be my mentor. And you can guess how that worked out. (laughs) Um, and instead, since I couldn't find the been there, done that women in my industry to mentor me, I started, as my husband Kevin would say, I started collecting women like jewels on a crown. I would go to different women's groups and find one or two women that I really resonated with and then somewhere else and everything felt really networky which is great if you're going there for networking, but I was going for development. And so I um, ended up creating my very first peer group purely out of selfish reasons for my own like edification, quite frankly. And because I was struggling as a single mom and as a new executive at the ripe old age of 29, um, the first group was a working mother's group. 
And we had women from um, who had children who were infants. My son was five years old at the time. We had women who had children in their teens and in their 20s, and we got together on a monthly basis and shared best practices. That group spurred on another peer group that was a high potential female leaders group in the Pittsburgh region. So now where the first group had in common were working mothers, the second group were all ambitious young women in their 20s um, who wanted to um, take their career to the next level and we started meeting on a monthly basis so now I've got two groups of women meeting in my kitchen on a monthly basis and um, the second group we started to integrate some different things that we didn't have in the first group and that's where I really um, I transformed my life quite frankly both personally and professionally from the value of peers you know, if you think about as we move through, and it doesn't matter across the gender spectrum, across the generations, quite frankly, as we move through our life, it's not unlike a labyrinth. And there are certain barriers and obstacles that some of us face that others don't. And here's the thing about a labyrinth. No one successfully navigates it alone. And there are limitations to peer learning, right? We can all join arms and we can make our way through and, and figure out what obstacles we're going to overcome. But as peers, we don't know what we don't know. And that's where we need that layer of what I call vertical knowledge transfer, those been there, done that leaders, who as we're navigating that labyrinth, Michael, and we look down and we see a dead end and we're like, okay, everybody keep going. Somebody pops their head around the corner and says, whoa, 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 whoa. This is a corner, not a dead end. Come this way. Right? So I, to me, you know, in, in our group coaching model, there's this horizontal knowledge transfer, but then there's also vertical knowledge transfer. And great peer learning layers in both. Wow. That's uh, the notes I got from that. The labyrinth, you're not alone. There's always obstacles. But the one when he said it's a corner, not a dead end, that really hit home. And then having someone who's got, you know, vertical knowledge transfer and horizontal that yeah that's really well said that actually hit home yeah a lot of a lot of people think that it's a dead end but uh it's really just a corner i personally just came to a thing in my personal life where for me it wasn't a dead end it was a pivot so i called it a pivot and a pivot was going left or going right instead of going backwards so for me it's going left to go forwards because sometimes in a maze if you look at it like that you're going straight, you might think it's a dead end. No, it's a choice of going left to right, knowing that at some point you might go left to right, but to go forward, to go forward, you have to go left to right. So that's a great analogy uh, through there as well. Yeah, thank you for expanding and, and uh, telling us how it all started with the peer revolution as well. Talk about in the book, peer group coaching options. You talk about sort of one to two hours, two days, seven months, nine months, things called edge, thrive, jumpstart, ignite, coaching circles. Is that something you do professionally with? Yes. Yes, we do. That, I mean, that's what uh, I've been doing to make a living for the last nine years. Um, and, you know, we've, how do I want to say this? Um, what would be important to know is, and this kind of goes back to a question that you had asked earlier, Michael, about why now for the book. You know, I built Edge Leadership and I built it around my skill set, my natural skill set. And then around what I felt was needed in the world at the time. Now, our clients have always been Fortune 500 companies, not because they're the only ones who could use the model, but because what we did was we would bring together peers who were um, in distant locations from one another to share best practices virtually. And so if you were a great big company and you were a global company, then you could see a lot of value in that versus a small to mid-sized company that had everybody in the same building, I had a much tougher road to sell, you know, from a sales standpoint to say, there's value in getting all your mid-career leaders together to share best practices or your early career or your executives to share best practices together. And um, to me, that's important to share because while we have been doing this great work virtually with our clients for nine years, it wasn't until the pandemic forced everyone to work remotely that all of a sudden this question came up of how how do we stay connected how do we inspire belonging how do we you know continue to focus on equity and inclusion in this virtual space and um and that's when i thought you know what it's time to 
the language I would use is open source the model. You know, as a business owner, as an entrepreneur, we had built it. We, you know, we were making a very good living with what we had. We were bringing in coaches and training them and working underneath us. Um, but that's limiting the impact that the model could have. And so in 2013, I did a TED Talk. And what I learned in doing that TED Talk, which by the way, was the foundation of the book, I just didn't know it at the time. Um, what I learned from that is when you sign on to do a TED Talk, your ideas are now the world's ideas, right? You share them and you don't own them anymore. And that's truly at the heart of what my hope is for the book. Anybody can pick this book up and you can use the tenants that are in it to create a one hour group coaching experience with 500 people if you want. You can create a two hour, you can create a two day, you can do six or nine months like some of our longer programs. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. One thing that just ignited that when you said open source, I'm actually in the process of creating a, uh, a website called ideas.com where people can actually share open source their ideas and actually use it as a social network where people can help build those ideas and actually manifest those into fruition as well. So if anyone listening out there, uh, ideas.com. Uh, love that. But so I want to put a pin in that for a second and then circle back around because what you are creating is a peer learning platform, right? Correct. Exactly right. Yeah. That's that's exactly what you're doing. Someone's already got the company name, but anyway, I'll work on that, which is like a, it's a SaaS company. But anyway, moving on, talk about chapter two, a coaching revolution. I like the quote you said, individually we're one drop, but together we are an ocean as well. Now, you didn't say that quote, but amazing. You talk about the six six core elements. And number one, you talk about the container. And the container is what houses everything, which is self-awareness, outcomes, relevant content, practice arena, and one-on-one -on -one coaching as well. But talk about the definition of what, what, what do you mean when you talk about a container of that? So um, a container, the simple definition is that it all begins with intentionally constructing a safe space where people can practice vulnerability and can show up both personally and professionally. Struggles might be individual, but no one is solving them alone. Sharing individual challenges and inviting others into this vulnerability provides a superstructure of support and empathy for the whole. Uh, sorry, I just read the little summary of it. But yeah, what is your idea of self-awareness uh, after the container? Uh, you know, so being vulnerable with you, I struggled with this um, element of the model. And I think I shared with you earlier when I had initially written down, you know, the first one that came to me was container and then I went to outcomes and then I went to relevant content and then I circled back around and I said, no, there's a step before. And, um, and I struggled with constructing this chapter because I felt like so many coaches and so many people talk about self-awareness. What could I bring to the conversation that was unique? What could I bring that hadn't been said before? And so for me, um, this self-awareness process is around a couple things. First is sharing individual challenges um, and inviting others into our vulnerability. And so that is absolutely Dr. Brene Brown's work and that's infused in that for sure. Um, but this, when we do that, right, vulnerability begets vulnerability. Michael. And, um, you know, so that to me is what creates this superstructure of support is that, you know, when I open up and I share something that is important to me, you can't help as a human being, you can't help but lean into that and then want to share something with me that is important to you. And so in that way, we not only inspire vulnerability, but we get to practice empathy, which um, is, you know, we have an entire program around teaching leaders and executives around empathy because it's such an important skill. And again, another thing that we had been doing for years that came under this magnifying glass during the pandemic um, that leaders were at a deficit of either naturally because they, it simply wasn't a strength for them or were at an empathy deficit in that they were overusing their empathy and um, getting burned out. Yeah, you're totally right. I like how you said vulnerability begets vulnerability. And the more you share, the more people open up as well. And I think vulnerability is the key that unlocks people. And, you know, 
getting to that personal level as a spirit and talking about real things of what makes humans humans and dropping the mask. You know, we've been wearing the mask for a long time as a society and, you know, covering up all these things. So, um, yeah, great, great work. Uh, moving on, we can jump into the other stuff a little bit later on, uh, which talks about outcomes, relevant content, the practice arena, and one-on-one coaching. But you talk about challenging the script uh, in peer co- group coaching, which I found really amazing. The framework is participants are the experts, not the coach as well. So talk to us a little bit about that because I think that's a game changer because a lot of people think group coaching is I'm the facilitator, I know what's best and I'm going to tell you what's best where it's more instead of not being the coach, it's letting the participants be the experts. How did you un- uh, unpack that and, and what do you mean by that a little bit? Um, can you sort of deep dive into that a bit? Absolutely. I think it's a brilliant question. Um, And I will take a step back first, if I may, and then I'll explain it. And, you know, the first step is the difference between consulting and coaching, right? So when, and I sometimes am hired as a consultant to come into an organization and help them, um, you know, retool their university, for example, and take it from training to, you know, and integrate group coaching. A consultant is there to share their expertise, to share their experience, to share access to resources, and to help the client make connections that they wouldn't be able to make without you, right? Um, And then a coach is by definition a companion. You know, the image that I use with coaching is imagine as if we are walking in the woods together. A consultant is someone who grabs your hand and says, okay, come on this way. There's this fantastic waterfall over here. Come on, we're going to come this way. Or sometimes a consultant, I'm just saying, sometimes we push, right? We come over here and we're like, you just keep going, keep going. A few more steps, a few more steps. A coach walks beside you. It walks beside you on your path. And when you stop, we stop. And we ask thoughtful questions like, tell me about why we're stopping. You know, or do you want to head down here? Or do we, we ask lots of questions. So that I think is a really important distinction. Now, traditional one-on-one coaching, which is how all of us as coaches have learned how to coach. We go to coaching school, we get certified, we learn how to do a lot of these same things that are in the group coaching model, but we learn how to do them one-on-one, right? We have an intake, which is basically container building. Um, you know, we focus on what content the coachee wants to learn, all of these things. Um, And so with group coaching, then, what's really important is that the traditional group coaching model was one coach and like six to eight coaches, right? And the coach then coaches all six people. And there's usually a limit of six to eight, depending on the skill of the coach, because it is really hard to coach that many people at once. It's really hard to put our bias aside and to stay in, in, so basically what I would say is the traditional group coaching model was taking what we knew of one-on-one coaching and amplifying it to six people. And not every coach has that particular skill set. So that limited how much group coaching even got traction in the world, quite frankly, because not everybody is like, who, I'm gonna take that on. Our model, the peer model, is focused on creating this space where the coaches also become the coaches. And so in that way, we can have a cohort of 30 with one group coach. We can have a cohort, I have a cohort of 77 women right now in our Thrive program, um, and it's just me. But I don't need to be the be all and end all for everyone. And quite frankly, it doesn't benefit anyone if I am. You know, I've learned that when participants can become the coach and the coachee, Sometimes our learning is exponentially increased, not from what we receive, but from what we give. It's the contribution that increases our learning to heights we could have never even imagined. And quite frankly, you know, 50% of my work is with women and those identifying with femininity. And I often get hired. We need to increase the confidence of our women. You know, they're not showing up or they're not um, putting themselves in for promotions or they're stopping at this level in the organization. And what I can promise you is after 17 years of doing this work, how we increase confidence is through contribution. 
by creating the space for a single person to become the expert in something to share their best practices, hot damn, now I'm feeling like I'm good at this and my confidence increases. Amazing, amazing. Some of the notes I got from that, oh, I tell you said, turning the coachee into the coach as well. One of my questions was, how is this different than a mastermind? I've been involved in masterminds over the years as well. Um, love that. And I'm a huge fan of masterminds. And we actually leverage the mastermind as a best practice in the peer model. Um, in But it's separate, separate from coaching. So what I say is with a mastermind, and actually, I'll take you back when you had asked me how did I first... Um, how was I first inspired around peer coaching? That very first group, the Working Mothers Group, was a mastermind. And a mastermind is great at sharing best practices, but it's limited at only sharing best practices. That goes back to that horizontal knowledge transfer where we don't know what we don't know. We can only share what we have. And until we introduce relevant content, that whether it's a book or a podcast or you know a reflective worksheet, whatever it is, where we're thinking outside of what we can just bring to one another, we are limited. Where we're not bringing in you know, the been there, done that leaders and the vertical knowledge transfer that comes along with that. So to me, the mastermind is powerful, but it's only one part. The one-on-one -on -one coaching aspect of the model is where we teach each person, and again, this is very different if you only have a group of leaders for two days, you can't teach them the depths of one-on-one -on -one coaching like you could if you were spending nine months with them, for example. So um, you have to scale that as well. But in a two day, we call them jump starts. In a two day jump start, I can teach you the basic tenets of coaching. And then here's how adults learn. We learn through practice. So then immediately breaking you into small groups while you have a coaching card and you coach one another in your real challenges, personal and professional, which is woven. I hope you heard that throughout the book, Michael, because it's so important. We are whole people. So while all of our work at Edge Leadership is with Fortune 500 companies, high potential leaders, whatever that may look like. Yes, it's professional, but it's also about bringing in the personal challenges to practice the coaching skills. First of all, because what's happening at home is happening at work, right? What's, what is cooking with my husband and my 19 year old son, I am bringing to work every day. And you better believe that what's happening at work, I bring home to them. And actually never more so than right now where everything is in the same room. <laughs> Um, but we bring these challenges to one another as peers, and then we practice the skill of coaching with the challenges that each individual is facing so that everybody leaves that coaching experience with good first steps around a challenge that's keeping them up at night, an accountability partner to help hold them accountable to have the conversation or take the action or whatever it is that is coming out of that coaching experience, and everyone is learning the skill of coaching. So this is that concept of triads that I talk about in the book, that you have the entire group and pull folks out into triads and they meet on a monthly basis and share um, a coaching experience. So let's say it's, you know, it's Michael and it's me and it's um, Chantel and the three of us are in a triad and we get together for 90 minutes and Michael is coaching me first and he's saying, all right, Christy, what's the challenge that you brought to the table? And I'm saying, um, I've got my first podcast interview and I'm super nervous about it. Uh, and I would love to leave here with some good ideas of how I can show up well and authentic um, and also showcase how important I think this work is. And Michael says, all right, Christy, and he's got a coaching map and you're, you're using that, Michael, to coach me because remember, coaching is not consulting. So you've never, you know, maybe let's say you've never even heard of a podcast. You've never even listened to one. Do you need to be an expert to coach me? Absolutely not. You just need to know the right questions to get me to open up my capacity and think about how I want to show up. And what's Chantel doing this whole time that you're coaching me? She has an observer checklist. And at the end of that 20 or 30 minute coaching experience, now she's saying to you, all right, Michael, here's what you did well. 
You, you know, you didn't give her suggestions disguised as questions. You asked, you know, some really powerful coaching questions. You know, here are a couple things you did well, and here's one thing you could work on next time. Boy, you got caught up in her story. And you wanted all the details. And then we ran out of time at the end. And then we rotate. And now I coach Chantel and you give me feedback. So adults learn from the application of learning and coaching is no different. So at the end of, let's say, a six or nine months experience, after you've had multiple triads and gotten to practice um, coaching multiple personalities while also building relationships, while also going deeper into people's personal and professional challenges, while also realizing that you're not alone in your challenges because holy cow, these people are facing the same thing as you. And you're leaving there with this transferable skill of coaching, hugely powerful, totally missing from a mastermind. Well said, I got, I got a lot of notes from that. So the triads, which was um, amazing. So not only coaching, but getting feedback. So a lot of things we like in real life is getting, getting feedback and knowing where our strengths lie, where our weaknesses, what our blind spots are, what we might think we're communicating or think we communicate and we're actually not. So that that's great too. Moving on with the book, you one of the great quotes, the, the goal is not to be more of what we are today, but to position ourselves to become what we can't even imagine we might need to be tomorrow as well. So great little quote I got from the book. You, you jump into the keys vulnerability, but before jumping into vulnerability, I'm actually launching a, a six month program myself, which is for an accountability group for a body transformation for health. So I'm going through the stages of next month, start of my, May, all the way through end of October, I'm doing a, a body transformation. I've done masterminds, I've done group coaching, one-on-one -on -one coaching. I'm doing something completely different, which is similar to the peer revolution is, I'm getting a whole bunch of people together who want to transform their body and I want to learn from them. And I want to create a safe space of vulnerability where we can talk about what did you do? What are you doing? We get real life people who've had body transformations to talk about what they did and not learn from exactly authors. And, you know, I can get a whole bunch of authors on particular topics, but just learning from people instead of being the coach, be the coachee and get coached by the person who's also there as well. So a little bit different than a mastermind, but just having that open space of people in a, in a similar atmosphere. So I just wanted to add that as well and that transition with reading your book as well that sort of gave me those ideas as well to create that vertical and horizontal uh, relationship with the peer revolution as well you talk about where vulnerability uh, begins people need to reflect on their challenges of their stories talk about how critical the role of you know of, of vulnerability is in especially these these sessions and these these group uh, environments in group coaching oh i think vulnerability is huge it is um the birthplace of innovation uh, and that is not my quote, that is Dr. Brene Brown. Um, I learned that from her, without a doubt. You know, we often think of vulnerability as weakness and, you know, it's our greatest measure of courage. And it's also the birthplace of innovation. So how our companies and our teams and, you know, even in our lives, you know, like when you talk about the body transformation, it has to start with, and I'm not going to stay where I am. Like, I know where I want to be, and I'm not going to stay where I am. And here's why. And that why is going to be different for different people. But I promise you, every person who joins you for that group coaching experience is showing up because they have a reason why. And it's only when we can acknowledge that that we can create the space for ourselves to transform. Um, you know, when we avoid vulnerability, you know, here's what that looks like. It looks like that I have all the answers. Right. It looks like I'm going to I need to put my consultant hat on and convince you that this is how it should be done or the well, these are the best practices like a mastermind. Well, you know, you should do this and you should do this and you need to do this and you have to do this. And, you know, thinking about should need to have to. Those are judgment words. And I talk about this a lot in the book around, you know, when you're creating the container and this ties back to vulnerability. People are hesitant to be vulnerable because we fear being judged. And the reality is after 17 years of doing this work, here's what I can promise you. No one, no one judges you more harshly than you judge yourself. And it is that voice that we hear in our head that we just assume other people are going to do and we hold back. 
because of it. And so that is a part of the vulnerability process too, is recognizing how often I'm judging myself. And I think about your experience and what you are planning, you know, this journey for all of your people. And to me, that is a really big part of it. You know, that I am, you know, going to show up vulnerable wanting to transform and recognizing that as I do that, I am going to have judgments of myself that I should have done this before. Bless you. And, you know, why didn't I do it then? And why did I let myself get to this point? And I think that, you know, vulnerability is not just what we say to others, but it's recognizing what we say to ourselves. Yeah. And another, and another thing as well, like being vulnerable, I'm going to record these uh, not masterminds but these these accountability group sessions and put them online as well and then attract other people to say i want to be involved and i want to be on the on the it's going to be like a mini show as well like a bit of a journey uh so that's the way i'm looking at it but anyway that's that's something that i'm going to be vulnerable with my own private life as well and i've got my wife on board recently too so me and my wife are doing it so she'll do the females i'll do the males and we're not fitness people like we're you know we just want to get healthy so you know why not share that journey with others as well especially if you've got the platform and the audience to to share it with and it's a little bit of fun too but moving on one thing i got from the book you talked about the career growth and and I've never heard it this part as well. So the bottom of the mountain is called early career, mid career, and executive on the top. And you can talk about your yeah, age groups as well. So in your early teens and twenties, you obviously early career, thirties to forties, you might be mid career, and fifties to sixties, you might be uh, executive as well. But you t- you say think of how most of us get started on our professional journey. When we start in our career, it's like we start out in the field at the foot of the mountain. In this early career field, there are gorgeous wildflowers, cute animals, curiosities, and lots to explore. There's also dangers, sinkholes we don't know until we walk into them and fall, and dangerous coyotes that are on the prowl for native prey. So uh, great poetry there as well. Talk to us about you know the growth of mountain prism and how we have sort of also community personnel, professional, early career, mid-career executive. Uh, Absolutely. It's one of my favorite images in the book. So I'm so pleased that it resonated with you. Um, You know, when we think about a peer group, so the book is about how do we share best practices as peers? How do we learn from one another? Um, And peers often live in the same space right? The same developmental space. Um, But we can have both horizontal and vertical knowledge transfer in the same spot on the mountain. So let me give you an example. Let's say, so I often probably, I'm trying to think, probably 75% of our work is with mid-career leaders. So I define mid-career as um, more based on experience than age. So mid-career, it's usually um, people leaders, not always, you know, I, we do a lot of work with technology. So scrum masters and, you know, folks that are very matrixed um, also would, would benefit, you know, would fit in that same space. Um, but mid-career leaders are usually, could be as young as your late 20s um, because of your ambition, because of your aptitude, because of the risks you've taken, the opportunities, right? You can easily be a people leader and be 26 years old. Uh, I mean, I was for sure. And you can also still be in mid-career in your early 50s or longer. And what we know from the research is women tend to idle in mid-career a lot longer than men for a whole host of reasons. Um, But let's say mid-career is like that woodsy part of the mountain. So you described the early career as a field. I often say that the executive level is like the rocky, craggy area above the forest of the mountain, right? Where the air is a little thinner, um, the vegetation is scarce, and you can't quite see below the treetops to know what's happening in the woods. And in the woods around a mountain, the north face of the mountain can look very different than the south face. And there could be a forest fire on the eastern side of the mountain, right? So even within the same band, there are different experiences happening. Um, And this is where I go back to when I first started the company, I started with big global organizations who had leaders, you know, across countries or across the states in the U.S. And each person on the mountain thought that they were the only ones facing what they were facing. And so each person, um, you know, figured it out on their own. 
and figured it out on their own and figured it out on their own. And the value of bringing together people all around in the woods to learn from one another and to learn experiences from one another can be incredibly empowering. And also, um, what do I want to, like the, what comes up for me as I'm saying that is there's a real cost in our organizations with a lack of knowledge transfer. Um, you know, and a real cost in productivity, a real cost in engagement, especially right now, mid pandemic or end or wherever the heck we are with it, when we think we need to solve things on our own. But there is also huge benefit in connecting the different tiers together. So let's just say that when I, um, when I was a mid-career leader and I lived in, you know, the forested part of the mountain where there was a waterfall and there was a bear cave back there by that waterfall. And, you know, so you had to be really careful when you were going to get fresh water because the bears were there. And let's say that now I'm an executive and I am mentoring someone who is in the woods, in the mid-career woods. And I say to them, Whoo, don't go over by that waterfall. Um, you know, John got his leg bit off, near bit off back in the day, right? Like this is also the cost of mentoring when mentors aren't aware of what's actually happening in the woods, right? Because they're up in the rocky, craggy part and they can't see past the treetops. Now, a peer coach could say, that's a mighty good place to wait out a storm. There haven't been bears there in four years. And... It's also now part of the knowledge transfer that I can feed up in terms of feedback and perspective to my mentor where I can say, you know what, those bears moved out a couple of years ago and we just used it as a great shelter in a storm. Now that executive has perspective that they didn't have before, which now incites the strategy that they can take and the value they can continue to provide for the organization. Well said. And one of the notes I got, one of my thinking when I was reading the book was just breaking silos. We have organizations have, you know, been built on these silos for decades and even centuries. You know, up the top, we don't know what happens at boardroom level. We don't know what happens at middle management level. We get, you know, the information gets filtered down, but never gets filtered up as well. And it's about breaking that cycle of, of a company is, is based on individuals and humans. And yes, we know there's certain secrets within organizations as well, but there's no need for these, you know, behind wall meetings on certain things. Like let's be vulnerable and let's get together and uh, get the information from the bottom up and from the, from the top down as well. And have that, you know, open source company or have that open source. <laughs> It's just, I don't know, economic slavery just means, you know, I think we're coming out of those periods where we realize that we're all human and there's no need to, you know, pretend we're beat our chest, we're bigger than someone else because we've got a title or we've got a certain position where we manage people. It's very archaic and I like how you said the analogy about the, the cave and, and the bears as well because at the end of the day, we're, we're all just animals let's 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 play let's play together but anyway amazing book i mean we could we could chat for another 45 to an hour about it as well and there's so much in it but i'm going to actually let the readers have an opportunity to go and buy the book as well so uh christy where is the best place they can find you follow you website or buy the book is it amazon or a website or what's the best place yep you can head right to the peerrevolution.com um and we have links to all different online booksellers um if it's easier to pull up your amazon app and type in my name you can do that too and it'll be the first thing that comes up Perfect. And I'll promote this uh, to my audience as well. But yeah, go out there, buy the book. It is amazing as well. Yeah, Christy, thanks for all your work and what you're doing. And yeah, thanks for being on the Best Book Bits podcast. And we'll speak to you soon. Oh, the pleasure was mine. Thank you for having me. There will never be another first podcast for me, Michael Knight. So thank you. No, I'm glad. I'm glad. I'm glad I was your first on this one. So uh, I hope you get on many more others as well. And we'll get your name out there as well. So I'll, I'll speak to you soon. Okay. Thank you. So